son or teaching him this year? Yeah. He, we, he was remote for a few months, so uh -huh. we were doing a little bit at home, but um, he's since been, we, we, we live in Kensington, so it's such a small, a small school, so they've been in person since November, which is nice. I love that school. I remember yeah. when I was young, I did uh, gymnastics shows there. We oh, had neat. a co-ed squad, and uh, it was great fun. Oh, yeah, it's a great little school. It is. All righty, I'm going to go ahead and play this video while we're waiting for people to come in. Uh, a lot of these events already happened, but good info on a recap of what's happened so far. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to Exeter Lit Fest 2021. Each April, our literary festival celebrates local authors. Due to COVID, we find ourselves with a small virtual festival this year, but no matter. It just makes it a bit more cozy. Hi, my name is Renee Allen, and I invite you to get comfortable and enjoy our offerings for 2021. While we wait for people to finish logging on to this Zoom, I'll share our schedule. Our Thursday night keynote speaker is Exeter-born author Victoria Arlen. Her journey from a coma to a Paralympian to a contestant on Dancing with the Stars to an ESPN commentator is truly remarkable. Last year, she had her flight booked to return to Exeter to speak for us at the town hall, but obviously we had to cancel the event. We are honored that she graciously agreed to participate in this year's virtual event. Now on Friday night, our event is a mix of four local authors in a party style Zoom about writing and publishing. Alex Myers, Lisa Bunker, Laura Bricker, and myself. Saturday morning, we invite children to a story hour at 9 a.m., courtesy of the Exeter Public Library. Then at 11 a.m., you will meet Susan Cole Ross, another author with a newly released homeschooling memoir. If you need a Zoom link to any of these events, send an email to exeterlitfest at gmail.com. Please also visit our website where you can find a database of local authors, past and present, and two downloadable local literary trail maps. Walking our downtown literary trails is a great socially distanced activity for you and your family this spring. Our website is exeterlitfest.com. We hope to hold next April's Lit Fest in person again, but for this year, please enjoy the virtual show. We thank Exeter TV for filming this, and we thank you for your support. All right. Great. Okay. Well, I think we have everybody here now so we can start. Um, welcome. Um, good morning. Welcome everyone to our final event of Exeter Lit Fest 2021. I'm Steph Schmidt. I'm the manager of Water Street Bookstore and also a member of the Lit Fest board. We are so happy to have Susan Cole Ross with us today. She will be in conversation with Jack Herney. Jack is an instructor emeritus at Phillips Exeter Academy in the history department, and he has served on many boards and organizations, including on the Lit Fest board. We'll now pass it off to Jack to introduce Susan. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, and nice to see you, Suze. Good morning. Hey, Jack. I was never so happy to see you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, I don't have to hold the book up because I never do that correctly, but you can see the book right behind you. That's that's perfect. Um, <laughs> Little plug. Yeah, just it, we need those. Um, I suspect that many of the folks uh, listening um, already know Suze because she's a native. She grew up here in Exeter, the daughter of very prominent folks in town. Uh, Mom was head of the school board for a while. Suze is a alum of the local schools in town. Um, she's a longtime resident of Elliott Street, right in the middle of town. Um, and she and I got to know each other many years ago, uh, sitting around a table talking about U.S. history, uh, and that was um, a lot of fun. So uh, I'm sure she is uh, familiar to many of you. For those who don't know Suze, and actually for those who knew her in town, she left us, uh, left town, Exeter, and went off. Um, fortunately, she's back in the area now, but what she did when she left Exeter uh, prepared her to write the book that you can see over her shoulder there that we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> she had 40 years of preparing to write this book, um, and in that 40 years, that included uh, a degree in psychology, 
a um, couple of master's degrees in um, learning, uh, as a learning specialist um, and special education. Uh, she taught for about 40 years uh, in many schools, uh, learning disabilities, um, reading specialists, techniques, and that sort of thing. Um, she served as uh, president of the Northeast Association of Learning Specialists and counseled with all sorts of teachers about how to teach um, special ed, how to teach generally. So she's had a lot of preparation for uh, what we're going to talk about today in writing uh, this book. But there's more to Sue's than all that, uh, which you will see when you read the book. Uh, and some of these things actually are important in being a good educator. Um, she's a pretty good skier, for one thing, even though she picked it up sort of later in life. Um, she's an early riser, and that's very important, puts her ahead of the game immediately. Um, she knows how to make maple syrup. She's a New Englander. Uh, she uh, can build a lean-to. And when you read the book, you'll learn that she earned the title Fire Goddess. <laughs> so all of those things are somewhat useful to her uh, in teaching her children. And you'll see this when you uh, read the book. So that's Sue's Cole Ross. Great to be with you this morning. So let's get right into the book. Um, this is, interestingly, a book, really, the substance was created 25 years ago when your kids were preschool, uh, Matt, pre-high school, uh, Matt and Tim. Uh, and you did voluntarily what everybody has had to do in the last year, that is teach at home. Um, you did that, uh, as I said, by choice, uh, as opposed to what everybody else in America did uh, this year. But you did it 25 years ago. So give us a little framework there. What brought all that about, that you would take your kids from school, move them upstate, uh, and teach them at home? Give us some background. Well, part of it was I missed home. Um, but the big part was my husband got a sabbatical. He had been serving at Loomis Chafee School for a dozen years, and he earned a year um, paid to go off and study teaching. And we decided, um, after looking at going around the world, across the country, that we could go across the country, but we really needed a home base. And we considered New Hampshire our home base, and we wanted to be by the lakes and the mountains um, where we loved living and uh, a nice break from suburban life for our children. We wanted to ground them in what we were grounded in, a more um, rural experience. So we took off for the top of a mountain. Um, in the prep school world, you know people. And we had someone who offered him a coaching job, someone who offered me the opportunity to do some t tutoring to help us try to put the budget together, which would allow us to do this, and someone who allowed us to rent their home on the top of a mountain that was stunning. Um, so much of the book is my breathtaking mornings, drinking tea and looking out over the mountains of the white, uh, the foothills of the White Mountains. Sounds fabulous. Uh, we all want to be there. Uh, it sounds wonderful. Um, but your kids had friends uh, in school, obviously. You were taking them out of there for a year. How'd they feel about all that? Well, that's a really good question. Um, Matt initially was in no way. He was in eighth grade, um, but he he felt, I think, as much as we did, that even though he was in eighth grade, he was very young because he learned to read early. And um, he an extra year before going to a tough prep school wouldn't hurt him. And he was, at the time, thinking either Phillips Exeter or Loomis Chafee, where we lived. And um, so I think he understood some of the value of getting to um, learn at a different pace before he started really hunkering down. Um, he was only 13. 
and um, he was headed for a transition anyway. So he knew that there was going to be some loss. Tim, it was easier. The idea of not going to school was very appealing to him because school was so painful for him. He was still reading at a first to second grade level. His comprehension was higher. Um, very bright, very bright young man. But uh, he had gotten to the age where we don't learn to read, we read to learn. And uh, he wasn't ready to read to learn. And uh, that was putting him behind the eight ball in class more and more and more. And school was becoming miserable. Mm. So we had to do something. Necessity is the uh, mother of invention. And it was a very inventive year. And we all learned. And I want to get into exactly that, namely how you learned and what you learned. Um, but that was 25 years ago, interestingly. Um, and what you wrote back then as a journal, um, had you written a journal before you started off to the mountains? Well, my father would tell you, your friend, my father would tell you, I was a slightly emotional child. And I always found writing was a good place to put my emotions when they got too big. So yeah, I'd always written. Um, in fact, come to think of it, in seventh grade, I was kind of daunted and, and fascinated. We had gone to live in Arlington, Virginia, and I was kind of troubled by that suburban life uh, and um, drug culture and all this stuff that I'd been a little sheltered from growing up, up at a prep school. And uh, so I wrote a story about uh, a girl getting involved in drugs and things, stuff I really was way beyond me in seventh grade. And my teacher was so taken with it. He let me work on this as part of my English curriculum for the longest time. And then my dad had it all typed up by one of the school secretaries who did that on the side. And we sent it off to Seventeen Magazine. It wasn't selected, but that was my first book. Interestingly enough, I don't even know if I still have it. Sure. Um, so seventh grade was my was the first time I wrote a book. But that uh, opus you don't know that's in the uh, Susan Cole Ross papers at this moment. You don't know where it is. I think it's probably in my father's. Uh, he has a file for each of us, and oh. I'll have to check. I bet it's in there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what you did um, when you moved back for that year away? You wrote a journal and so on, twenty, and it doesn't get published. You don't do anything with it for twenty-five years. Here well, we are. I did. I did try to get it published in um, two thousand four. Huh? Our fellow a fellow alum, uh, Ned Hallowell, was excited about it, and he took it to his publishers. I had sent it off to publishers, and as we learned last night, you don't do that. They don't read. Um, I got one kind of not total rejection, but the rest were all rejections. Um, and then Ned Hallowell's team was interested, and a dozen read it, and 11 wanted to publish it, but they had to have a unanimous vote. So it did not get published in 2004. And then I started teaching the public schools again, um, leaving my practice as a learning specialist to work with elementary school kids, and life just took over. And there, were, uh, there was always another student who needed me. Well, personal uh, note, I'd say 11 to 1 uh, should have won the day, but uh, they have their rules, I guess. Okay, so it's 25 years after the event, and you, you finally do get it published. Why did you uh, begin the process again, uh, having been rejected in 2004, but do it now? Well, a couple of reasons. I'm semi-retired, which uh, gives me the time and the perspective and COVID. Uh, I knew uh, I needed to find something to do at home um, while spending time with my mother and who would otherwise be quite isolated. And um, this was something that I could finally pull out of the bottom drawer and, and play around with. But more importantly, my niece and nephew came and they said that they were thinking of taking the year off, homeschooling their kids, and um, going back to Washington State. They live in DC. And I said, oh, I did that 25 years ago. In fact, I have a book about it. And my nephew looked at me with huge eyes. He's a history teacher like you. And he said, well, Aunt Suze, you gotta get that published. Everybody's doing it this year. 
<laughs> so, you know, out of the mouths of babes, I did as my good nephew told me, and I got it published. Oh, ah. Uh. Um, early on in the book, you talk about that uh, just a bit. I wonder if you'd um, give us a little reading about um, sort of how 25-year experience uh, before much of the Internet and everything else could be relevant today. Um, could you read a little bit about that? Well, let's see. Um... Indeed, with the internet, the purely academic part of each day would have been right at hand, as would a myriad of museums, a world of experts, and a bevy of books. Ours was another kind of remote learning. That is also what made it so special. With so much schooling happening online these days, children may benefit at home from a more unplugged learning that we del delved into. Our opportunities to learn away from the computer strike me as uniquely precious and prescient. Our distinct privileges and challenges aside, and two and a half decades past, I suspect this book has more relevance today than ever. It serves not as a how-to reference, nor as a perfect paradigm for homeschooling. Rather, I hope that it shows that there is no formula and shouldn't be, because each learner and each family is different, and their diversity offers the greatest potential for authentic and meaningful learning. Schooling at home, is more art than science and resembles tutoring or modeling far more than teaching a classroom full of students. In illustrating how our family uniquely crafted a learning community to fit each of us, every opportunity and every season, I hope that other families feel invited and inspired to craft their own. Ours is just a story, a story whose time has finally come. A grandmother now, I greatly credit my children and husband for helping me to have since become a professional in the field of learning and motivation. Looking back at our sabbatical after 25 years of parenting and instructing teachers on educational methods and incentives, I believe this journal shares on a personal level, critical reflections on the essence of teaching and learning. Piaget documented much of what we know about how children learn by observing his own children at home. In the same tradition, Jeff and I observed, taught, and coached our preteen sons to levels of success we did not dream to expect. At its best moments, our story illuminates how children quench, quench their natural curiosities. It explores how they find what my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Brooks calls there are islands of competence, those areas where a child shines and finds out how to contribute his talents and passions to the world. Today, I hope this story may empower families to explore such possibilities in the face of extraordinary times. Together, I hope we can make this a time of extraordinary possibilities for our children. So that sums it up pretty well uh, about why 25 years experience um, ago um, it might be relevant today. And I love the phrase in there that you, and it, let's get into exactly what you did and, and how you did it. I love the phrase in there where you say you crafted a learning community to fit each of us. Talk a little bit about that. What, what did that learning community look like for Matt and Tim? Um, what kinds of things did you do? What did you have patterns? Did you have a structured day? What did it look like? We did. We started each day with the dailies. Um, I had packed up my classroom very carefully, choosing, having been a middle school teacher, choosing all the eighth grade and sixth grade curriculum that I wanted the children to uh, devour. And I say devour because I think learning should be like that. And it's not for all kids. But as I packed up my classroom, it, I had months to do this. I was able to keep drawing things that I knew they would love. I knew what the Matthew books would be, what, what would really turn them on, like, um, oh, um, To Kill a Mockingbird and uh, books of that sort. And I knew what would turn Tim on, like Roald Dahl and things that, that you know, are a little wacky. Um, so as I packed those up and had my 
teaching supplies. And I was still thinking this was going to be like a classroom. So I had all these worksheets and teaching supplies and, and uh, curricula that, that I had purchased over the years for larger classes. Um, so that was all ready in folders. So I could, when Matt started reading To Kill a Mockingbird, out came the To Kill a Mockingbird folder. And those things are available online and, and they're terrific resources. So we set the mornings up with those dailies. Jeff would set up the um, a terrific uh, algebra, pre-algebra course for Matt and um, early uh, geometry class for Tim. And in the morning, they would do those dailies. Uh, Kathy Dunbar provided all the French practice for Matt. So that was all in folders and had to be mailed back and forth with Kathy. We did things kind of the old fashioned way because we didn't have access to the internet. Uh, it was a toll call and we just couldn't afford it. Wow. So, so mornings were like school at home um with kind of um initially in the morning everybody was asleep and i was writing and then i would make breakfast while the kids would watch one you know the news on television usually a pbs version we only had four television channels so they could watch nbc abc cbs or pbs and that was fantastic um because it limited their choices to some pretty good choices. So PBS was available at the beginning and end of each day so that I could cook. And that gave us something to talk about over breakfast and over dinner. So that was sort of current events and bringing them into the, the world out there. Uh, it's neat. So then you settle down to sort of uh, somewhat structured classroom activities, be it math or French or or uh, English or whatever. Yep, and silent reading time. And our read aloud time was in the evening around the fire. Um, and uh, then they would have a little free time together to plan their afternoon, but it had to be educational. And that, of course, could include physical education. Yeah, and, and uh, how did you choose what to read aloud at night around the fire? As a committee of four, uh, it, it sometimes just brimmed out of what they were reading. Um, it, uh, it might be something that's a favorite of mine or Jeff's. Um, sometimes it was stories. Um, you know, we just tripped over things all the time that we wanted to share as a family. And usually Jeff or I would have those on hand. Yeah. Um, favorites that were maybe above their reading level or that we felt uh, needed some adult discussion. Uh, did everybody participate in the reading aloud? Did everybody read aloud? No, 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 we wouldn't put Tim in that position. Reading aloud was very hard for him at that time to process uh, decoding, comprehension, inflection, and um, speaking, it's just too many processes for a child with a learning disability. So reading out loud, they should be allowed to practice and prepare. Um, so no, we didn't do that kind of reading. Okay. Um, sometimes Matt would read from one of his books. We allowed him to choose his own books for every other book. And um, so he went with, you know, a classic we chose. And then it was always Michael Crichton, which was always gory and horrific. <laughs> and... <laughs> He would often read aloud from that, and Tim got fascinated. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there was one point in the book where we allowed Tim to uh, watch a movie or something about Michael Crichton, and it was something to do with It, one of Michael Crichton's book. And uh, I said if he read a page, then he could do this horrific thing that I really didn't want him to to do and he ended up regretting it he had nightmares but it was good it was good lesson and uh, he didn't ask again but he fought his way through the whole page at a well, 11th grade reading level because he wanted to put out the, those challenges and uh, the kids will meet them if it's important that's great you, you mentioned just now that uh, they had to do some planning of their own activities in the afternoon. Uh, to, tell us something about what those amounted to. What kinds of things did they do? What kind of planning did they come up with? 
Well, they were very interested in mountain biking. We'd never lived near the mountains before. We um, lived on a flat school campus in the flatlands near Hartford. Um, so there wasn't, there just wasn't a lot available that um, went up and down. So they were both somewhat due for new bikes. We never got new bikes. They were always used, but um, one of the mountains was selling the bikes at the end of the season as they switched from mountain biking to Watersville Valley, I think, to um, skiing. And we got some deals. So they each had a new mountain bike for them. They were used, but they were the rentals from the ski mountain. And so they were especially interested in that. So they got some books on mountain biking from the local librarian who became a great friend and a wonderful resource. She got to know their um, passions and had things set aside for them all the time at the Holderness Free Library in Holderness, New Hampshire. And um, we were living at the top of a mountain up there and they would plan a trail and there was a trail map and they would take it and um, take off the two of them with us waiting in the parking lot, praying they'll be back. <laughs> And, and that was uh, certainly part of their physical education, um, certainly. Um, and orienteering and map use and all the things that are taught in middle school. Ah, uh, ah, uh, terrific. Uh, you mentioned the library. Um, were there other resources available outside what you brought in those folders uh, in the community that you could draw on? a huge amount. Um, Plymouth, New Hampshire is just a bevy of, um, we went to Thornton Gore and, you know, experienced the, actually the man in the mountain was still up. I remember going by the man in the mountain and seeing two bears climbing the hill and then studying about bears and are they really dangerous and are they ex becoming extinct and all these questions the boys had. Um, we went to the polar caves were nearby. Um, the Squam Lake Science Center was fascinating. We used to go there every two weeks. Um, we got to know the animals they kept there. They had um, some wild animals that they protected there um, who had been injured in some way. Um, and then through the library we and the science center, we also had passes to all sorts of um, science centers. And we ended up going to the Boston Museum and there we got a pass that was good for about a hundred other museums across the country. So when we took our cross country trip, we could go to museums all over the country. Wow. Yeah, um, I think there's a part in your book where you say that anybody who is thinking of homeschooling should immediately join a science museum because they're so valuable. Um, and and uh, this sabbatical year was first going to be a lot of travel and then you decided to go to the mountaintop, but you did do travel too. Tell us a little bit about that and how that fit into uh, the education that the kids had for the year. Well, in the afternoons, they couldn't plan mountain biking trips for a whole year. So at some point we transitioned in November to them spending the afternoons planning our trip. They had to come up with the budget. They had to come up with where we'd stay. They had to find out how to get there, how to get back. They had to plan the entire trip, including knowing some history of the places we would go. It was huge. It was a wonderful unit. Um, in, in teacher terms. And um, it involved math, science, history, orienteering, uh, geography, you name it, and really knowing your United States. And it was their chance to get intimately involved. So they came up with the budget, they came up with the plan, and, and it had to be tight. And Matt discovered, which was fascinating, that we could fly out with um, American Airlines and come back on Amtrak. So we went to Salt Lake City after visiting my parents in Exeter for Christmas and then Jeff's parents in Ohio for Christmas, which got us halfway out and dropping off our dog with Jeff's sister. Um, our father, my father-in-law drove us to the airport and we flew to Salt Lake City. And there we stayed above 
uh, an avalanche. Actually, there had been an a there was an avalanche when we got there, which locked us at the top of a mountain, and we had um, bright. Uh, it wasn't Brighton. Anyway, we had two mountains to ski, pretty much to ourselves because of the avalanches. Mm -hmm. So that was very cool. Um, and we could let the kids just go because in the West, there are so few trees, we could see them all the way down the mountain and meet them at the bottom, which was what we had to do because we could not keep up with them. <laughs> Those kids, absolutely, yeah. The learning curve for children is ridiculous. Yeah. Go back to, uh, you were saying that the kids did all the planning, the budgeting, uh, the, the, the uh, where they're going to stay and so on. This is pretty much before the internet, isn't it? Where do they get this material? They get it from the library? How, how do they go about it? We went that? to a travel agent. Remember ah. those? <laughs> oh, that's right. There were those back then, of course. <laughs> um, another industry that has been annihilated. But um, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time with the travel agent. Um, they asked a lot of really insightful questions. They got a lot of um, brochures. They poured over the brochures together. Um, Matt reading to Tim. Matt was really a uh, number one teacher uh, for the year. And, um, you know, the research shows that we remember 90% of what we teach and only 30% of what we read. Mm -hmm. So Matt uh, did some serious learning that year. Wow. Very interesting. Um, uh, um, I want to get into exactly what they might have learned in a, in a minute, but um, to stay on the, the, the travels for a bit, uh, for those who are, we're all going to be able to get out of town pretty soon since we're getting our shots and so on. Um, of, of the places you visited as a family, what would you suggest to people listening about a terrific learning experience that you can have out there in the great American um, environment out there? You know, we took three or four trips, but the big one was the one cross country. And um, that one was cool because on the way back, we were able to get off the train at three different places, which actually gave us five places to explore. Um, and I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of about the book is that it, it gives you an opportunity this year while you can't travel um, to travel across the country and go to these different places and listen to my husband explain the history, which was, he's a history teacher and, and just, he's encyclopedic in his memory of, of history and, and places and people. And he could just set the kids. We, we went into the um, Sulphur Springs and he just starts telling about, um, oh, the, the Wild West man who had tuberculosis, help me. Um, and how he went to use the Sulphur Springs to, to heal him and uh, Doc Holliday. And it actually killed him, that it, it burned out his lungs more quickly. But the theory was that the sulfur would cure tuberculosis. So he went there to, to save him. And he, above that spring, there's this hotel, huge hotel, where Teddy Roosevelt's stood and gave a famous uh, speech. And so we're, we're sitting in these springs, you know, sweating with the steam rising off us. I can't even see two feet in front of my eyes. And Jeff is teaching us all about Teddy Roosevelt giving the speech <laughs> at this hotel. Wonderful. So I think the lesson there, and all of you listening, uh, be sure you get it. When you travel, take a historian with you. Uh, I'm sure there are good volunteer. Um, that's great. That's great. Um, tell me, I'm, I'm interested. Um, you crafted the curriculum. Uh, you and, and the boys in, were involved in it, and certainly Jeff was too, your husband. Um, what do you think the kids got out of this year, away from school, away from their friends? What did they learn? that they couldn't have learned in school. What, what kind of lessons or, or um, uh, what kind of uh, insights, um, what kind of skills they develop that they might not have had they not done what you did? You know, that's starting to 
uh, really uh, come to me now because of the pandemic, they both just bought new houses. Um, Matt and Michelle moved back to New Hampshire from Oregon where they were living the life on a vineyard as a chef and a sommelier. And they've chosen to a home that's very much like the home we lived in that year. So it must have had some deep effect on them. Um, and, and Tim has bought a farm with his uh, fiance. And um, he, she has just read it to him. This is the first time Tim has experienced the book beginning to end. Um, Matt read it and wrote the introduction. Um, Jeff, of course, read it I and, and helped me edit it. And as you know, my father read it and edited it, which um, means it's pretty clean. <laughs> but Tim had never, you know, really read it. He knew the stories and we've read parts of it, but his fiance has read it with him beginning to end. And he said, yeah, that was the best year of my life. And it's funny. The house we just bought is so much about that, me being able to go back in the woods, around the pond, and live that way, just paddling on the pond and, and building my own little, he wants to build a, a cabin where friends can stay, and um, living in the land. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what they learned was nature and uh, teaching themselves, learning independently. I think people are really worried about how far behind students are in certain math skills and things this year. But I, I think they should, I think it's important to realize children are gonna learn. And maybe what they learned this year is resilience, which is the number one uh, quality that, that leads people to success and um, curiosity and uh, research, self-generated research and taking charge of their own learning. And if teachers can take advantage of that next year and help students take charge and take advantage of their own learning rather than um, struggling when students may buck the system a little because they're used they're be, they've become very good consumers and and they they may want more of a say in their own learning next year um if we can take that and run with it and let student learn from their passions and embrace self-directed learning as we did in the book i think this generation could be extremely successful that's it, it, very interesting because of course uh when kids go to school, uh, they are taught the curriculum that the teacher comes up with and the notion of self-generated research, researching what they want to research rather than what they're told to research um, is less likely to happen than what happened in your environment with just the family where you said, it's up to you. Um, you find what to research. Very interesting notion. You also well, say- it's hard in schools because you need a scope and sequence. Or Sure. So blending self and uh, directed learning and so scope and sequence is is challenging, but it's worth the challenge because you have motivation. Yeah. By the way, we're going to leave some time at the end. So those of you listening, if you want to, uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in chat or we'll give you some time at the end to just join in. Um, but be thinking about questions if you want. I want to go on to, uh, you say uh, at one point in the book, We've talked about what the kids might have gotten out of this year that they wouldn't have gotten out of uh, a regular educational environment. You all say in the preface that all four of us became teachers and learners. So we've talked about the kids. What would you say you and Jeff learned as teachers and learners uh, from this year that you might not have learned had you not had the experience? Well, one thing I do in the book, um, I made a very definite uh, plan because my husband's a, a sweet private man. Um, so I, I don't try to speak for him. And if I left him out of the book a little bit, it was more by his choice than mine. Um, it's his, his uh, what he learned, 
I, I wouldn't presume to say. Um, I know he loved the year and he loved teaching. And I think he's often commented on how he knows more about how kids learn, especially kids with learning problems, which he was not an expert in that field um, because of that year. So he would say, I think, that he learned from loving kids and watching them learn and, and encouraging them to learn. He became a better coach. He became a better teacher. And it served him better than he thinks his two master's degrees, which served him well. Mm -hmm. um, I learned to breathe. I had been on a bit of a roller, you know, uh, a, a treadmill, getting through a master's degree, getting my first job in a public school, working with a huge caseload, um, learning how to teach kids that you don't know really well because um, in the public schools, I wasn't living with them as I had when I was teaching philosophy at Loomis Chafee. I also learned, I think, um, my voice because my kids didn't need me as much anymore. They'd become quite independent men. And I think I put my voice into the book and learned what I had to offer as a teacher of teachers, which is what I became afterwards. Um, and I think I learned a lot about what turns kids on in the classroom. And I think I used that and still use it when in my work with students who struggle, who are no longer turned on. Mm. Very interesting. I have questions, but I, I invited questions from the uh, listeners and we have one or two. So I, I wanna go to those and then I'll hopefully have time for the, my other questions, but it depends on the panelists. But Jonathan Ring, good old Jonathan Ring says, um, how did you socialize your sons uh, during homeschooling? That was easier than we thought. Um, Matt started playing for a baseball team before we even went, so we had to run back and forth from Connecticut. Um, and so he was on a Babe Ruth team, and, and he also was on a football team. Um, these were not school teams. These were um, the independent uh, teams. Tim uh, was also on a, a baseball team. Um, for his age group. So they, they had a, a clan of friends quickly. And fortunately, we had a next door neighbor who was Tim's age, who loved mountain biking and, and uh, skateboarding and, and um, rollerblading. So we went to Waterville Valley together with his, his mother and I took the kids to Waterville Valley a lot. Um, they also came over to our house because it was on top of a mountain and uh, would spend the night camping in our woods, um, listening for moose and things. Um, Matt, during the winter, no longer had football or baseball, and that was tough. So he went out for the town, um, the town elementary school invited him onto their basketball team. And by then we knew enough people to, to ask, and um, that was terrific. So he'd have the school day with us, but then at the end of the day, Usually after we'd gone skiing in the afternoon, he would have basketball practice with the other kids. So he got to know the kids pretty well. Interestingly about that, uh, knowing the other kids, it didn't take them long. Um, by February, they were begging us to let them go to the local school. Now wow. that may be because we stunk as teachers, but I think more likely they realized that school is, and, and they know now that work is a pretty good place to be if you wanna be with peers with a common passion. And so they both went back to school in April in the local schools and uh, we hadn't repeated them. Um, they did phenomenally well, um, returning to school in April at the same grade level they had been the year before, but now Matt had terrific writing skills. Tim was reading on grade level and um, they got to experience for three months the success they were going to have the next year mm -hmm. at nice a sweet little school. Yeah. So the socialization part uh, for them is quite a bit different uh, from 
what students have undergone the last year where they couldn't have done those sports in most cases and so on. They could, even though they were taught at home with just the four of you, uh, the rest of their life was with the groups, which is quite a bit different. Um, than Fortunately, this year, baseball has done well. Um, it just seems to be a sport that has um, lent itself to social distancing, and it's been handled so responsibly in New Hampshire that baseball has actually survived this year. Yeah. And um, I'm actually planning our town's uh, beginning opening day now to make sure it's safe. <laughs> You're doing the planning of that? That's yes, good. that's my little piece. Jeff is on the board. He's an umpire. Ah, I'm, I'm sure it will come off very well then. Um, John has another question. Jonathan has another question, which I want to get to. But I, I do want to get to uh, a couple of areas or another area that, that um, it, it touches on some of the things we've talked about on LitFest and other sessions this year. Uh, and that is about writing um, and your writing. You say it one part of the book um, that you say that a special corner for writing and listening appeals to me. What does exactly does that mean? What is your special writing style practices? How do you write? When do you write? Where do you write? I'm very nature bound. Um, that's why I took all the photographs um, in the book. Um, that's that's my art. That's um, I, I grow my own food. Um, I always say I, I I don't grow it. God does, and and I think that's true of my writing too. Um, and that's what I meant by listen. I need to be somewhere where I can kind of hear what's going through my head, and I can't entirely take credit for it all. I think some of it comes from people who came before me. But I do have a moment in here um, that's short. It's just a paragraph about what I consider the perfect writing scene. The mist beyond our deck finally rises after the rain, exposing Squam Lake and all its islands in the valley below and the barest outline of Mount Chikorua in the distant Northeast. Sipping from my favorite loon mug, I feel as though I belong in a tea commercial. Could I ever take living up here for granted? The sunrise to the right of the foliaged mountain threads through the brightening sky with pinks and blues and yellows above the white sliver of mist that rises off the lake. This is a writer's paradise. Mm -hmm. Margaret Mead and Rollo May summered on this very hill to write. Mead's words support our decision to spend our sabbatical winter exploring America. Be grounded in your own culture. Know who you are and know what your culture is all about. They say that when she visited other cultures, the anthropologist always kept her free hand open when she was writing. She did this intentionally to express her openness and friendship toward the people she met. I hope we have met people here with the same open hand. They certainly have met us that way. As I write about our neighbors, our small town culture, and about my favorite anthropologist, I hope Mead's inspiration still stirs in the brisk air. Very nice, very nice. You put us right on that deck or porch wherever you were writing there, uh, very moving. There's another question um, that has come up. Um, this is from Judith Ward. Uh, did you network with other parents who were also homeschooling? I did not. I didn't know anyone. In those days, nobody was homeschooling unless they kind of rejected things about public school. Um, it wasn't It wasn't a thing, at least not that I knew of. Um, I was certainly networking with other teachers because I was working with students who struggled at Holderness School. Very fortunately, they asked me to work with a, a student during the summer. And then when school began again, and, and we were looking at a very tight budget, um, I, I ended up working with 12 of their students. And that was a terrific year in the beginning of my career as a learning specialist. So and, and those you, other teachers I was seeing every day were great to talk to about our kids. And Judith's question uh, raised the, um, so you couldn't, sort of read up on homeschooling uh, before you went? 
No, I didn't even know what it was. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe that's an advantage. Um, I didn't have any resources. Um, I was a, I didn't think of that as, as a plug-in. Um, I'm now friends with a homeschooling uh, community and um, have done some consulting for them. And it's marvelous. Uh, I wish I had had that, but I'm kind of glad I didn't too, because uh, I like how the boys crafted our year and their learning experiences. Hmm. Kind of like Abe Lincoln. Yeah. You, you, you um, mentioned uh, Margaret Mead um, as some something of an inspiration. Um, were there other writers, authors uh, that inspired you? Um, at the time you did this, at the time you were planning this, um, are there folks, uh, people you read that um, sort of gave you the impetus to, to do this, to A, write, um, but also to uh, to take your family away and, and, and homeschool, but, but also the literary heroes that might have inspired you? Well, Jane Austen, Jane Austen, Jane Austen. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, at the time, I was studying Lucy, Lucy Calkins for my own professional uh, edification, and um, Donald Murray and Don Hall were my teachers at the New Hampshire Writing uh, Institute at the end of the book uh, in the summer. Um, it was Don uh, Hall who said to me, just write it, just say it, which was a great gift because you know my dad, he was a history professor, but also uh, author of 10 books. The idea of writing a book in his shadow just wasn't real to me. But I thought that it had to be written like a history book, you know, with lots of research. I had just come out of my master's degree. And so I thought everything had to be um, documented and, and footnoted. And that took some of the fun out of it for me. When I realized I could just write it, and, and not research it, that maybe all these years of education might mean that I have some voice and I have some authority and I don't need to prove it with um, footnotes, though there are some footnotes in my book. Um, that was very freeing, letting my own experience and my own knowledge uh, be, the, be the gift. Mm -hmm. um, but th th that doesn't mean I didn't, I mean, I had, been studying writing and I had been running a writing workshop at my schools so long that I can't even list you all the inspirations. Sure, sure. Um, I'm gonna go back to one of uh, Jonathan's, um, I'm gonna end with, uh, there are some other comments that I wanna end with too, um, but uh, because Jonathan takes us back to connecting uh, what you did with uh, the last year, he says, much has been told us this past year about the COVID problem of remote learning and the expected social um, troubles that will result due to isolation since students are not in the classroom. What is your opinion? I think we can learn from isolation. Um, I think, as I said, kids are gonna learn a lot of resilience. My mother talks about the days when um, she was watching for enemy planes as a 17 year old on top of the seminary building in Exeter um, and helping her father um, build the victory farms. I think I have, am a farmer because my grandfather was in charge of the victory farms in Exeter during the World War II. I think we learn a lot from adversity. Um, I think we've all been through some, maybe not this big. Um, my mom had to live 91 years to see two such large um, life changing for everyone. Uh, moments in American history. Um, it teaches us resilience. It teaches us that we have much to give to ourselves. Um, if we see this as a cocoon and use it as a cocoon, I think we can do some real flying when we come out. I think education is changed forever. And I hope we can discover um, the Northeast Association of Learning Specialists is, is spending April discussing and um, trying to learn from each other. What are the takeaways? What are we going to use from this year going forward so that education is better? 
forever. Um, Zoom certainly won't hurt us uh, on snow days, for instance. Um, maybe that's a possibility so we don't have to you know, shift our schedules in June. Don't know. What are the keepers and what, are, what do we want to let go? I think uh, change is terribly disruptive and nerve wracking and we hate it and we need to let it be our teacher. Very interesting. Let your downtime be your classroom. But by all means, let's not tell the, stu uh, the kids that we're gonna get rid of snow days yet because uh, that was one of the great things about being in school. Um, yeah. Here's another one. Um, this is from Kathleen Kerber. Depending on your kid's personality and mental health, those influences affected how they reacted to the pandemic. One strived through this and the other is severely struggling. I guess that's a comment. Um, yeah, the, the, it certainly does depend on how kids have, if that's... Very true. And, and I don't mean to um, in any way um, suggest that kids aren't struggling. They are struggling. It's very painful. And we as professionals need to come together and help them. And we need to get creative about it. There are wonderful, wonderful mental health um, offerings available online, some free. Um, I would highly recommend on Fridays, um, uh, Lynn Lyons works with families on anxiety and she's been doing the fluster cut, fluster cut, I can't remember the name, um, but it's on um, Facebook and um, she, she's brilliant. One of the things she taught me that I use all the time with my students is, okay, who's driving the bus here? Your anxiety or you? Give anxiety a name, call him George, tell him, get in the passenger seat, I'm driving this bus. <laughs> again, for the listening audience, who is that person again they can write down? Lynn Lyons. Okay, very good. L Y O N S. Yeah, okay. She's in Concord, New Hampshire. Okay. Um, we're, we've got about a minute left. Um, and I, 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 if there are no other questions, I do want to read uh, for um, Sue's. Um, a couple of the comments. One, teaching is a crafted gift. I know I would have loved struggling uh, doing something like this with the kids, but I struggle teaching kids. It is so difficult to teach and a hundred times harder with your own kids. Kudos to you. That's to you. And uh, another way- It was a hundred times harder. It was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but as Judith Ward says, what a trailblazer. That's you too. So- um, Good for you. Um, what, uh, to get back uh, in the moment we have, um, one question was, did you um, refer to um, uh, Lynn Lyons? Yeah. Um, Henry David Thoreau, uh, did he ever enter into your reading since you were going off to the woods? I think Matt read some Thoreau, although he became a real fan, fan of Faulkner that year. And uh, I, I certainly am a great admirer of, of um, Thoreau, though more um, of the Concord group, um, my favorite would be um, Louisa May Alcott. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the appreciation, I just found Thoreau a little cranky, but his appreciation of, of nature, yes. Yeah. And, and that, by the way, um, as I'm sure you all know, is a, is a day trip away that is wonderful to walk around Walden Pond. We went there, too. I don't think I documented it, but we did go there. We go there, too. Good for the you. kids had been born in Concord. Wonderful. Well, I think we've come to the end of the hour, um, and uh, I want to thank Suze for being part of the Lip Fest this year. And um, I want to thank my favorite professor of all time, Jack Herney. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, this is, as I said to Suze in my email tour, a dandy book. Um, it's going to take you uh, on a journey, not only north of here to where Suze and the family spent time in Holderness and Plymouth, 
and the wonderful North Country of New Hampshire, but all over the country on their trip. So by all means, pick it up and go for the ride because it's a delight. <laughs> nice to see you all. Thank and, you. And uh, that's the end of today's program. All righty, thank you everybody.